All right, I'm going to call the first panel up and moderator, uh, Sakita Tillman, who is a clinical teaching fellow in our low income taxpayer clinic. And I'll turn it over to you, Sakina. You can sit there. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you. Uh... Margaret for the introduction. I'm like Margaret said, I'm Sakina Tillman. I am a clinical fellow here in the Low Income Taxpayers Clinic at University of Baltimore School of Law. And I am excited to be here today, but I'm more excited to hear from our panelists. So let me introduce them. The first panelist that we have is Ariel DeCoster. Um, he used, she used the pronouns they or them, studies law, um, involvement in upholding certain social hierarchies based on sex and gender, race, sexual orientation, and bodily ability, grounded within critical strands of legal theory, such as feminist, queer, legal theory, as well as critical race theory. Ariel's writing aims to challenge the cis heteropediatricity, racism, and ableism from a legal theoretical perspective. After their Fulbright student experience at UCLA, they started their PhD research at the University of Eftwerk and Glenn University, Belgium, as a FWO, Research Foundation Flounders Fellow. Their project is titled Masculinity as Property and aims to produce a new legal theory on a relationship between gender, law, and power. Our second panelist that we have is Gerard Dunley, is an assistant professor at assistant professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh Laws. Her scholarship focuses on issues surrounding pregnancy, abortion, reproductive justice. Our third panelist is on Zoom. Her name is Laura Lane Still. She has been a Forrester Fellow at U Lane Law School since 2020. In the fall of 2022, she would join the faculty at the University of South Carolina School of Law as an assistant professor. Her research and teaching focuses on sex and sexuality and anti-discrimination law and family law. Prior to UT Lane Law School, she clerked for the Honorable Jane R. Roth of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. She earned her JD from Harvard Law School in 2016 and a BA from Washington University in St. Louis in 2010. So welcome to panelists for today. Now for every panelist, you have 15 minutes for your presentation. And then after the presentations are over, we'll open up the floor for questions. So our first panelist, Ariel, do I stand there or how do I? You can <clears> sit <throat> here and. Because I do have a PowerPoint. You're welcome yes. to show the podium. Exactly. No, it's just for the presentation. Yeah. I'm not very sure. Yeah. Actually. And we'll get. There it is. Um, we don't have slide up. Yeah. Actually, my days are in the next part and I can see. The okay, sure. Um, is this the first one? Yeah, this is. Okay. No, this is not the first one. This is the first one. <laughs> So hi, um, my name is Ariel, pronouns are they, them. I'm a researcher at the University of Antwerp and the University of Ghent, which are two universities in Belgium. I'm also a visiting researcher at King's College in London. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to present my research, Masculinity is Property. It's an ongoing project, so I very much welcome all of your feedback. Um, and in order to present my research, I will first maybe tell you a bit more about the research problem. So how did this research come about? What is it trying to answer? I will then dive more into property theory and more specifically property and identity um, in order to be able to give you a model to think about property that then finally allows us to make the analogy with masculinity. <coughs> all right, so this is heteropatriarchy, an ongoing phenomenon. Um, as we all know, gender-based oppression is, um, well, very real. It is both objectively um, documentable, but also subjectively experienced. And so, in the past, that was very much explicit. Today, this continues. But within our um, society and liberal way of thinking, gender-based oppression has very much or very often been um, reduced to discrimination. And it's been said to be this you know, differential treatment on the basis of gender that is not justified. And so the logical response to that has been to adopt anti-discrimination laws. So in the US, I think you have Title VII, you have the 14th Amendment. We also have all, I mean, in Europe, so uh, where I'm from, we have all these anti-discrimination um, laws and they've been around for really quite a while now. Um, but the problem is that they've been here for so long and yet inequality persists. And so what I, I was really trying to understand is we have all these laws, it's unequal to do so. And 
yet it keeps on going on. So then I was like, okay, we have actually two, two paths, paths. We can do two things. Either we continue the entry discrimination path, um, and in that line, what we could do is we could fine tune our entry discrimination theory. So we could um, reinvent or rethink the way what discrimination is. And so in that regard, you have, for example, um, the notion of standard equality, but you also have transformative equality. Um, we could also just advocate for a better application of entry discrimination theories, because a lot of people say, well, the problem right now is just that they're not being properly applied. If they would, then there would be no more inequality. Another thing could be uh, to say, well, okay, they're good. They're maybe not perfect. But so what we need to do now is just complement them with other gender conscious remedies, such as, for example, affirmative action, other kind of things uh, in tax law, social security law, employment law. And I think that is super valuable. But I also think that we can take this observation that inequality persists, even if we have entry discrimination laws, as a sort of starting point to actually rethink the whole way that law of gender and power interact um, and do it, rethink it from the very beginning on. Um, and that's actually the big idea that I want to introduce. That's what I would like to do. I would like to create this new theory that does that. And I suggest that how we can see the, the links between gender power and law is by analogizing masculinity to property. So in a nutshell, why do we need this new theory? Um, or what will this new theory do? I think it will, one, it will allow us to make sense of contemporary legal developments that entrench gender-based um, discrimination or inequality or oppression. Um, so very much we have, we have cases that are being brought and they speak the language of anti-discrimination, but actually in the long run, they're not really helping us or they're, they might be beneficial to some people, but not to other people. And so um, this theory should allow us to actually explain what's going on there. Say, and then not only allow us to see what's going on in legal development, but also give us the language, a new vocabulary to be able to point out what's going on. And um, I suggest that then that is, you know, in these legal cases, you could be saying, oh, look, here the law is actually um, protecting masculinity's worth um, as a form of property. And then it should also ideally allow us to assess reforms, whether they actually uh, devalue the worth of masculinity or whether they mainly um, perpetuate its value and then it's, well, the, the reform is not really useful. So how does this theory work? Or uh, what am I, how, how do I develop this theory? I think it's useful to actually start focusing on privilege rather than oppression. I think it's really, really useful to focus on oppression. And that's also what a lot of feminist legal theorizing has been doing in the past. The problem is that by theorizing oppression and the lived experiences of women and gender diverse people, trans people, non binary people, intersex people, is that, well, in the past, that has led to a lot of, well, an essentializing impulse. And it's led to, problems and critiques of and, and a discussion about who is more oppressed, who is less oppressed, what does it mean to be a woman, who can be a woman, who cannot be a woman. And I think these debates are really, really valuable um, because they tell us a lot about how power works. At the same time, I also think that sometimes that can be or become an unproductive, unproductive strategy. And I think by focusing on um, who benefits from structural oppression in an intersectional way, that is white, cis, straight, bodily enabled, um, bodies that are able to claim masculinity. Well, I think that we can sort of start over again and build coalitions and fight together against what actually oppresses all, be it actually at different degrees. Um, and then in a nutshell, what is this theory? What does it stand for? I say, or like I try to show that masculinity is just like property in the sense that both of them are a settled, unequal arrangement of identity, both individual and collective identity as well as the ability, ability in the sense of enablement, power, um, power arrangements, uh, both private, so vis-a-vis -vis others, but also collective, vis-a-vis -vis for public, vis-a-vis -vis society at large, that are actually upheld and protected by law. And so, because the law is set up to protect this um, arrangement of identity and ability that masculinity is, um, masculinity is actually a political relationship between individuals that functions as a social legal resource that is actively mobilized in and beyond our court in order to gain or maintain power. And so this might sound a little abstract right now, um, <laughs> that makes sense. It's also, I think I first need to say maybe a little bit more about property and how I conceptualize property, so for you to be able to grasp that better. So property law has traditionally been defined as the law of resource allocation. So it has been trying to answer <laughs> questions like, what is property? 
Uh, when does it arise? Why does someone have a privileged access to certain goods? And why are we supposed to protect this as a society? Um, it's also, that's really a place where you get all these theories, labor theory, utility theory, where you get exclusion theory. Is, is property a bundle of sticks or is it actually one specific thing? So that's where you get all of that debate. Um, and well, researching that, what I found is that there's a bunch of scholars that are sort of writing on the margins of those conventional uh, property theory. And what they're trying to do is they, they take the discourse and sometimes they distort it, sometimes they actually use it or subvert it. And they do so in order to develop models of property that allow them to show how property and identity are linked in a society that is fundamentally characterized by power um, dynamics that are unequal. Um, here you have an overview of these scholars that I think <clears throat> are really creating or constituting the field of the emerging field of property and identity. Now, I don't have time to talk all about them, but they come back uh, later. Um, just wanted to mention Cheryl Harris, Whiteness as Property. The title, as you'll see, I was greatly inspired by, um, by her piece. Her piece is very foundational in critical race theory. Um, she basically tries to show how white privilege is a form of property that is guaranteed by US law, even after the adoption of the 14th Amendment, in order to show how um, even now that we have this 14th Amendment, US law still is very much racist and opposed, supports a racial stratification of people and power dynamics that come with that. Um, and also that, just to say, this has really been sort of um, foundational for a lot of these other scholars. They keep going back. She was sort of the first to make that analogy and then people started playing with it and applying it to different uh, identity um, categories. But researching that, what I found is that um, property does more than only allocating resources. In allocating resources, it actually also defines identity and ability. So individual identity. If you look at, um, well, at, at, uh, at property theory, even just if you go back to law, the very basics, you know, uh, you have a cell that has property over its body and itself. And so therefore, every time it labors something, it mixes um, the world or whatever it's laboring with its body. And in that way, it appropriates. And that's how property is set to constitute. But as, as Davis shows, actually, in the, the self-owning self that then generates property, it's always already actually split between the subject or the thing that owns and the thing that is being owned. So property inherently actually relies on the subject-object divide. Um, that's, that's the basic structure of property. Property is about a, an object that belongs to a subject. And so in this way, by requiring this sort of dialectical relationship between subject and object, property um, requires or postulates the subject. And in this way, it actually ratifies personhood. Um, property constitutes personhood almost, if you want. But property not only um, creates individual identity in the sense of personhood, it also actually creates um, group um, group belonging or collective identity. How this is uh, Cooper that actually says, you can analyze um, property sort of as a relationship of belonging. It's a twofold relationship of belonging. On the one hand, when I say I own this house, I'm saying the house, object belongs to me, subject. But at the same time, when I say I own this house, I am actually inserting myself into, so as part, into a whole society, a society that recognizes what this relationship between a subject and an object means. So what property means. And we're going to just speak into the mic. So sorry to interrupt. That's it's fine. Long oh, that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> it's very sad. They want to hear it all. <laughs> OK, sorry. So anyways, um, as I was saying, the, Property can be said to be this dialectical, uh, this twofold relationship of belonging, both between a subject and object and between a part and a whole. Um, and therefore, actually, property identifies who belongs in the course of determining what belongs. Um, but then property also actually um, constitutes private ability in the sense of um, what I can do vis-a-vis um, -vis someone else. So property is fundamentally a power relationship. You see this. Um, if you go back to property theory, there's always been come up a justification for why we need to have private property. And then what happens is a few years later, you get a critique on the given justification saying that it generates inequality. And so fundamentally, property has always been about um, power relationships. Uh, but also, if you really think about it, what it is, it is a right. And as a right, it is a 
relationship between individuals, between subjects with reference to a thing. And so it means that I can say what someone else can do or cannot do um, with a certain thing. And so therefore it is fundamentally an arrangement of um, interpersonal arrangement over who can do what. But also if you if you read Keenan's piece, uh, Subversive Property, um, it really becomes um, obvious how property could be seen as a performance. It's something that requires iteration and recognition. So maybe a story that will help you, that, that will help me explain it a little bit better is when I was living in LA, I remember just being overwhelmed by the private property, do not trespass. And um, I, I was walking with a friend and I saw a bench and I was really tired and I wanted to go sit on the bench, but the bench was on a lawn of, of a house. And so I just wanted to go sit. And he was like, no, you, you cannot go sit there. It's private property. Like, you know, they, they'll call you for trespassing. And I, and I was started really thinking about this because it's like, well, but actually nothing physically is preventing me from going to sit on the bench. Like I can literally just go sit there. But I, I could not because property. And then I realized the fact that my friend was like, no, you cannot go sit there. It, it's sort of property is a script. It's a regular a regulatory ideal, a fiction that structures the way that we relate with each other. Because we have all these ideas about what property is, and this is property, I recognize it as property. I'm not allowed to go sit on the bench. And if I do, someone might call the police. And so um, it really is, is a script that, that, that defines the way that we look at the world, the way that we engage with other people. Um, and it requires reiteration and recognition or enforcement. If actually everyone would just decide to ignore the script and go sit on a bench, there would be no property at all or no more property. And it needs to be recognized or enforced by society. If there's no one to enforce it, then what's the point? Like, again, there's no more property. And so property as a regulatory ideal defined by power dynamics that determines uh, what one can do or cannot do. And in this way, structures interpersonal relationships. <laughs> Collective ability at last. Um, property has in the past been a explicit condition to be able to um, be a politician or participate in political power. And still today, it is informally that way. Uh, through notions of class, but also just, um, well, you know, generally people that are politicians are uh, wealthier. And so then if you look at masculinity, basically it is all of the same things and the law upholds it in literally the same way. So first ratification mm -hmm. of subjecthood. Gender is essential to subjecthood. You're actually not even able to talk about a person without attributing them a gender in the first place. So gender really conditions um, subjecthood. And the law, again, sees this as well or, or upholds this as well. Law only recognizes legal subjects that are one, human beings, and two, properly gendered. Non-binary people are most of the time or in most jurisdictions still not recognized uh, for law. And then also masculinity does determine group belonging. Uh, owning masculinity means that you belong to the group of men. And here again, we see that the law does this as well or recognizes this and upholds this. Um, you are assigned a sex at birth, which means that the law is assigning you to a certain group. And then it's going to police who can belong to that group or who cannot belong to that group. Uh, if you want to change your legal gender, there's all these abusive requirements. And so it's really policing the boundaries of who can belong and who cannot belong. But also gender as a performance, uh, Butler theory, don't have the time to explain it right now. But basically, it is um, this way, this embodiment, this constant reproduction that we do. And in this way, it is a regulatory fiction. It doesn't really exist, but it also exists because we constantly create it. And in this way, it actually, one minute. Okay. We, it also structures interpersonal um, relationships and it does so in an unequal way because, um, well, basically men just have benefits. Uh, I always see of this in men spreading when I'm sitting on the tube or just like, <laughs> I, I get really frustrated because it's just men taking up space and actually being like, look, I have, the, they don't even think about it. It's like, I have the right to be here and take up the space and you need to give me this space. So, um, and you see the law, the embodiment of masculinity is an assertion of private ability. But then also law recognizes this again. It is an engendering discourse that validates and bestows enforcement of masculinity as a regulatory ideal. The way that it is gendered and engenders, uh, it's actually giving that validation to this regulatory ideal that structures our interpersonal um, relationships. Tickets to governance basically doesn't even matter, but just, um, well, most, most politicians are just men, just look at pictures and, and you'll get the idea. Um, but then this is my final slide. So masculinity, um, what I come to, the embodiment of masculinity actually functions just like a property claim. Um, it is a ratification of personhood 
It is an affirmation of belonging, and it is also an assertion of both private and um, public power. And that all these things are actually validated and co-created by law. The law is set up to protect masculinity's worth as property. So the current arrangement of identity and ability that masculinity is, because masculinity is just like property, an arrangement of identity and ability, actually benefits men in this society and present. And so as a form of property, the law actually is set up to protect this arrangement of uh, identity and ability. And in as much as that arrangement currently benefits men, the law is legalizing and protecting gender-based oppression. And so this is why the current status quo of gender relations, that is this arrangement of identity and ability that is masculinity, becomes the net, a neutral baseline against, against which reforms are adjudicated. And generally, it is my thesis that courts will invalidate progressive reforms or only validate reforms that devalue masculinity the least. So in conclusion or in result, uh, masculinity is actually a political relationship between individuals that functions as a social legal resource that uh, can be used to gain or maintain power. So thank you for listening. Work in progress. So if this was unclear, this is on me. This is not on you. Um, <laughs> it's also very much abstract still yet. So please, just anything that's unclear, shoot it at me and I will use it to clarify further this paper. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Aria. Thank you. Our next presentation is for Laura Lane Still, and she's on Zoom. Sorry, could um, could Greer go next? I'm almost finished figuring out my technical issues. <laughs> okay. Yes, happy to. Oh, okay, Greer. Great. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for having me here. I'm delighted to be able to speak today. Um, the paper I'm present, this is on, right? Um, okay. The paper I'm presenting today is currently titled Subjective Fetal Personhood. Um, it's very much a joint effort with my wonderful co author, Jill Lenz. This paper attempts to reconcile a perceived conflict between supporting abortion rights and recognizing pregnancy loss. This tension is a result of a long time explicit anti-abortion strategy to give fetuses a host of legal protections under the law um, in the hopes of creating fetal personhood and ending abortion outright. This strategy, as a result of this strategy, the abortion rights movement historically pushed against any efforts that would give fetuses status under the law, even when it was those efforts were to support pregnant people. Today, this tension is less explicit. Uh, but it is more of an implicit um, or an avoidance or a general discomfort in talking about and advocating um, for those who experience pregnancy loss. And why is that? Well, because pregnant people who experience loss often see their pregnancy as more than a fetus, as a baby or a child, and grieve that loss deeply. The abortion rights community as a whole often wants to stay away from that issue, to stay away from the possibility that a fetus has value because it begs the question, what was lost? We attempt to, to offer an answer to that question, one that will not cede any ground on abortion rights. But first, we describe the irony that women who experience abortion are often pitted against those who experience pregnancy loss, um, despite how similar the two experiences are. So the first section of our paper um, talks about how the, the physical experiences are very similar, if not identical. So early abortion, abortion throughout the first 10 weeks of pregnancy is often completed by a medication, um, two medications actually, um, and those medications essentially mimic the experience of pregnancy loss. Um, and even for um, later abortions, um, or the, for later abortions, the same medications and surgical procedures are used as those that are used to treat a missed miscarriage or an incomplete miscarriage. So the physical experience is very similar. Um, additionally, both groups also um, um, experience stigma and secrecy. Um, so generally speaking, pregnant people don't talk about their abortions or their pregnancy losses. Research in both communities shows that pregnant people experience self-blame, guilt, and shame after both pregnancy loss and abortion, in part because of the isolation and stigma that surrounds both experiences. 
And finally, we also talk about how the same groups of people are the ones that are most likely to be affected by both pregnancy loss and abortion. So if you look at the research, you'll see that marginalized women are more likely to experience both. In particular, women of color, poor women, and young women are more likely to, to need both abortion and to have pregnancy losses in their reproductive lifetime. So despite all of these similarities, why is there this huge difference? Well, there's this perception um, that the two groups diverge in one central important area, which is how they perceive their fetus, right? How they perceive the pregnancy. The stereotype here is that women who have abortions or people who have abortions are hostile or indifferent to the fetus, while women who lose pregnancies are bereaved mothers. We go into great depth to say um, in the paper that this treats both groups as a monolith. Um, if you look at the research, you'll actually find that many women or people who have abortions call their pregnancy a baby, grieve the death, and find some way to try to say goodbye after an abortion. On the other hand, it looks like about a quarter of pregnant people who experience miscarriage or loss, especially early loss or miscarriage after an unwanted pregnancy, will experience relief or um, they will not necessarily perceive um, that they lost a child or a baby. So if the way a pregnancy ends is not predictive of fetal attachment, what is? We go through a bunch of social science research to try to identify the types of variables that influence attachment at pregnancy. One of the most, one of the most significant is intent. So you can look at the research surrounding surrogacy and see that if a woman gets pregnant without the intention of actually parenting, um, that attachment is going to be different. This also helps explain the difference in attachment when a pregnancy is wanted versus when it's unwanted. We talk a lot about the length, how the length of a pregnancy influences attachment and general stillbirths, which is pregnancy loss after 20 weeks, um, are grieved more deeply than early miscarriages, although not always. Some of this is because there's this expectation that the further along in pregnancy you are, the more likely this will lead to a live birth. And any of us who have experienced loss in the past know that there's actually research showing that people who get pregnant after loss are much less likely to attach for a while because they're protecting themselves. Technology plays an important role here. So when ultrasound entered the clinical experience, it was actually done in part to facilitate maternal child bonding. And there's a ton of research showing that techs try to personify the fetus, right? Oh, your baby's being stubborn. Oh, the baby has your mother's lips, right? They talk about that as you're getting an ultrasound. And as technology has become advanced, there are new ways to personify a pregnancy, right? You can learn the sex now as early as 10 to 12 weeks, um, things that my mother's generation never had access to. Disclosure to others plays a role. So you have um, what researchers call social birth, which is the concept that a birth that happens before physical birth when a baby enters social structures like families, right? Is your Are your parents buying new onesies? Is your older child talking to your stomach? Things like that. But taking this all together, our main finding from the social science research is that the process of fetal attachment is subjective and relational. There is no one moment where every woman feels attached. The attachment develops at different times for different, for different reasons, um, and some people never feel it at all. So if this is a social science literature, how does it compare to the law? Well, one area in the law that really reflects this um, lived experience is tort law. Um, a pregnant person can sue someone who tortiously causes them to lose a pregnancy, and the court must literally value the fetus in that instance. I'm not an expert on tort law. That is actually what my co-author is an expert in. But generally, but generally speaking, a person who lost their pregnancy because of tortious conduct can sue under two possible theories, wrongful death or negligence. Under wrongful death law, the woman is compensated for the lost potential and actual relationship with her fetus. This is an inherently subjective process where the, where the person who lost the pregnancy must literally testify about what their relationship was and what they hope to get from it and what um, to understand what their damages would be. Under negligence law, the woman is compensated for the emotional distress of the injury. We go into much more depth in the paper about these two causes of action, but the, the final conclusion we reach is that tort law values a pregnancy in the fetus much like women do or people do, which is that it's subjective and relational. Every pregnancy is valued differently for every person. And the most important consequence of this conclusion is that it is not based on a fixed notion of fetal value, which is the anti-abortion concept of fetal value, where pregnant, the value of pregnancy is inherent and it starts at conception and it is true for every single fetus. 
Um, so in other words, our understanding of relational um, fetal personhood or relational fetal value is completely inconsistent with the concept of um, personhood advanced by the anti-abortion movement. So we use these conclusions um, to suggest um, that we can, as a movement, value a pregnancy loss without creating a slippery slope to personhood, and tort law shows us the way to do that. We note in the paper that this um, approach is not without risk. Um, those risks are obvious to any of us who read the news and watch the criminalization of pregnancy that has um, happened in criminal law, where criminal law really values the fetus, much like, like the anti-abortion movement does. But we then spend a ton of time at the end focusing on what the benefits are of this approach. We talk about the future fight ahead. Many of us in this room um, know that um, Roe versus Wade, right, as interpreted by Planned Parenthood versus Casey, um, is very likely to be gutted or overturn overturned this term. Um, if that happens, there is going to be a future entanglement of abortion and pregnancy loss moving forward. Uh, many people will start self-managing their own abortions. We're seeing, we've been seeing this for years, but it's um, increasingly happening in places like Texas. And again, when people self-manage their abortion with medication, this ex mimics the experience of miscarriage. And even though it's largely safe and effective to safe self-manage an abortion, there's going to be roughly one to two percent of pregnant people who experience complications and will need to seek medical care at hospitals. Um, people are already at, at, um, are already telling folks that are in this situation to feign pregnancy loss to avoid detection, right? And so we're going to start seeing likely what we see in other countries where the emergency room becomes a place of investigation, um, where all of a sudden, if someone comes to the um, hospital experiencing any kind of loss, they will be immediately suspected of self-managing, right? And we're going to see more and more criminalization of pregnancy. It's so important to know, as many people in this room already do, that marginalized women are the mo ones most likely to be targeted, um, and especially those who are not trying to get pregnant and are relying on um, prenatal care. Um, so we make the argument that it's going to be important to have a united front moving forward to protect women who are both getting abortions, self-managing their abortions, and experiencing pregnancy loss. In my abortion rights advocacy, I've started talking to people in red states, abortion providers in red states, who are, ex are expecting that if Roe is overturned, they're going to start, you know, converting their abortion clinics and do early pregnancy care clinics to help um, help people who are experiencing complications from um, from um, from, uh, you know, any 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 sort of kind of first trimester complications. Um, it's also we make the argument that it's important um, this kind of. Focusing on all pregnant people and all pregnancy endings is an important part of removing stigma for those who do not have a pregnancy that ends in live birth. All parties suffer from a single path narrative of pregnancy, which suggests that all pregnancies end in a live birth to a smiling mother. Um, you know, of course, this leads to stigma and to shame that for all women or pregnant people who don't end with that um, outcome. So we think that it'll normalize all pregnancy outcomes or all pregnancy endings if we can move to kind of build alliances in this way. Um, you know, the outcome might not be happy, right? It might be traumatic, um, but it is normal. Um, abortion is normal. Pregnancy loss is normal. And it's important to note, right, that, that the same women who experience, that the same women experience a variety of pregnancy endings, right? In a person's reproductive life, they might have many live births, they might have miscarriages, they might have stillbirths, and they might have abortions. Most, many people have more than one of those things. And finally, we make the argument that this is a direct mirror to the, his, the historical movement of the woman protective rationale, which we see in the anti-abortion uh, movement. So, you know, if you go back 30, 40 years, um, there was this perception that the anti-abortion movement focused exclusively on the fetus and the abortion rights movement focused exclusively on the pregnant person. But after Casey, Planned Parenthood versus Casey in particular, the abortion rights movement recognized um, that it that was not going to win hearts and minds. It tried to rebrand itself using feminist frames to say that it was supporting women and the, and, uh, the fetus alike. Um, many people think that this was a very integral part of their movement of the last few decades. So what we are uh, proposing allows the abortion rights movement to do a very 
similar framing, right? To allow the abortion rights movement to have a way to talk about the fetus and to talk about um, fetal value that doesn't seed ground on abortion rights to support the whole pregnant person throughout the, the throughout their whole um, reproductive lifetime. We hope that this might actually be able to start capturing folks in the middle who feel conflicted about abortion because they recognize their own attachment in pregnancy or their own grief after a loss. So um, in conclusion, we um, argue that there's a way to recognize fetal value in both pregnancy loss and abortion, one that won't cause a slippery slope to personhood. And indeed, there might be a very good reason for doing so for the next phase of abortion rights that are coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Laura. Are you ready, Laura? Yes. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We're waiting for the video of the show. Okay. I can start talking if we're behind on time. Okay. Or I can wait. <laughs> What's that? You're hidden behind the chat. Oh, okay. <laughs> How about now? Perfect. Okay, excellent. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much to Sakina and the organizers of this conference. I'm very sorry I couldn't be here in person, but thank you for uh, accommodating me via Zoom um, so I could still share my paper and hear you all's thoughts. So this paper is still very much in its early stages, and I'm open to you know all types of feedback, including big picture questions and framing and framing questions. Um, so my article is called Contextual Identity. And essentially, it's about what's wrong with the way that legal actors make identity determinations in the law and then how to fix it. In this paper right now, I'm examining race, sex, and sexual orientation, but I'm thinking about maybe adding other identity categories like religion or disability. Um, in a previous article, uh, to which this is a follow-up, I examined identity determinations across different identity categories and areas of law. And I found a common problem, uh, namely that legal actors often adjudicate identity in what I call a context detached manner without carefully considering why a particular law is deploying identity in the first place to achieve its goal. And a great example of what I mean by a context detached approach comes from uh, Senator Marsha Blackburn's questioning to uh, Justice, now Justice, Ketanji Brown Jackson, when she asked her to define the word woman. Um, Senator Blackburn's question came in the middle of her sort of diatribe about the scare quote injustices arising from transgender women competing in women's sports. So it's been framed as this bad faith ploy to undermine uh, Brown Jackson's domination, trying to paint her as this radical progressive. But even if her question seems out of bounds, and, and it is, I think, but the basis of her question reflects a common belief, I, I think, among legal actors, namely that the category woman is capable of being located and defined without any context whatsoever, or that a legal actor can um, name the essential qualities of a woman without knowing why they're being asked to, des to describe a woman in the first place. But law doesn't treat other concepts this way. So imagine if Blackburn had asked Justice Brown Jackson to define another noun that changes meaning in the law, like the word home, but without providing any legal context. Uh, home might have some contextless general common sense definition in a non-legal setting, but no common sense definition of home could be imported into the many different areas of law that use this word. So someone's tax home isn't where they live, it's where they work. And then the meaning of home for the purposes of the Fourth Amendment for distinguishing between the home and curtilage is, of course, wide, widely different than the meaning of home and tax law. So I'm arguing basically that legal actors should treat identity more like other legally relevant concepts and adopt what I call a context informed approach to identity determinations. And under this approach, the identity inquiry begins by locating the stated function or purpose of the, of the applicable law and then tries to align the way that identity is determined with this stated function or purpose. Um, 
this approach understands identity as being capable of disaggregation into different sort of models or forms. So for instance, identity can mean how someone self-identifies to the public or how someone identifies privately, or it can mean how people perceive their identity among others. And then also different types of information can be relevant to these different models of identity. So how someone looks, how someone acts or performs their identity, certain biological related traits or ancestry, for instance, could have varying degrees of importance to different models of identity. So the context informed approach asks which model of identity or type of evidence best aligns with the stated function or purpose of the law, and then uses those that model and that evidence to determine identity. So in my remaining time, I'm gonna provide three examples of context attached approaches to identity uh, determinations in different areas of law, and then talk a little bit about what it would look like to shift to a context informed approach. Um, then to the extent I have time, I'm gonna tell you why I think a context informed approach is better than a context attached approach on at least four normative axes. And then I'll maybe, if I have time, discuss some potential problems and questions that I'm, I'm still thinking about with this project. So first, um, with sexual orientation, I looked at it in the context of asylum. Um, and the context attached approach here often stems from the fact that immigration judges focus too much on prior sex acts to determine whether someone is actually gay or queer or lesbian for the purposes of asylum. So an example of this uh, comes from Irene Makavision's case. So she um, brought, an asylum, brought, brought an asylum case claiming that she feared persecution on the grounds that she is a lesbian. She submitted a lot of evidence for her claim, including um, testimony from friends and family in her home country, attesting to the fact that she was a lesbian, evidence that she had been harmed by the police in her home country and evicted from her home country and raped, raped by her husband and his friends when they found out that she was a lesbian. The immigration judge, however, applied a context attached approach and rejected her claim um, to being a lesbian based on two primary things. One, the fact that she had previously been married to a man and two, the fact that she had not been in a, in a same-sex relationship with a woman or didn't at least allege that she had been in a same-sex relationship with a woman. So this, um, this approach is context attached because the method of identity determination didn't, doesn't align with the purpose. Um, there's lots of different purposes of asylum law, but the, per but the stated purpose as relevant here is to protect people from future persecution. Um, and so this I, this immigration judge didn't wasn't paying attention to the persecution prevention purpose of asylum when determining her identity. Uh, she would have been persecuted if returned to her own country, right? And but the immigration judge wasn't using this frame to determine her sexuality. Rather, he was evaluating whether she was truly a lesbian or not based on his own understanding of what a lesbian means. And his understanding, I suppose, was that lesbians don't marry men and lesbians and or lesbians are in relationships with women. So what would this look like then under a context informed approach? Well, I think that the method of identity determination that aligns with the goal of asylum is determining how the, how the petitioner's sexuality is or will be understood in their home country uh, upon their return. And this is different than determining whether someone is actually a lesbian or not. It shifts the focus to how they're understood in their home country. Uh, so this means, um, this doesn't mean that people who are actually queer are not eligible under this approach. It just means that that's not the ultimate question or the focus of the inquiry. Okay, so in Irene Makavision's case, uh, she would have won under a context informed approach, obviously. Um, she didn't lose because she failed to show that she was perceived as a lesbian in her home country. She lost based on who she had, had sex with and who she hadn't had sex with. Um, so turning now to race, um, the, the, I examine a couple of different contexts here, but the one I'll talk about now is with Title VII and similar laws. So um, some courts who are addressing uh, dis race discrimination claims mistakenly believe that they need to determine the plaintiff's actual race. So for example, if a plaintiff brought a claim alleging that they were discriminated against because they're black, some courts will attempt to determine for themselves 
if the plaintiff is in fact actually black. And the criteria judges use to make these determinations aren't based in any legal doctrine or any law whatsoever. Rather, they use what they call objective indicators of race, which may include things like appearance, racial performance, accent, ancestry, depending on the particular judge. So one example um, comes from um, comes from a case where a that involved a discrimination claim based on the plaintiff's um, Native American identity. So the judge ruled for the plaintiffs um, at summary judgment, uh, holding um, and determining that they could bring their claims to trial. Um, but he also determined that the plaintiffs had to provide proof of their Native American ancestry to ultimately prove discrimination at trial. Um, so in, in other words, the judge determined that ancestry constituted objective evidence of their Native American identity and that their discrimination claim required proof of that actual identity. Um, these, this example is context attached uh, because determining a plaintiff's actual identity does not align with the function or purpose of these anti-discrimination laws, which for our purposes, this function or purpose is to provide a remedy for people who face discrimination based on a protected category, so race, sex, et cetera. And because these laws are symmetrical, they protect all people of any race or religion or sex, et cetera. So therefore, they don't, plaintiffs don't need to prove that they are actually one particular race. Instead, they need to prove that their discrimination was based on race. Right. So rather than determining whether someone was discriminated because they are black and then determining whether they are actually black, the court just uh, needs to do what the statute already tells it to do, determine whether the discrimination was based on race. And here, things like perceived identity um, can come into play. Ultimately, this is a, this is a causation question, right? Was, was the plaintiff's ident perceived identity a cause um, of the harm that they are alleging. Turning now to the sex example, um, I look at sex segregated sports in the paper and I examine a couple different types of laws in this context, but here I'll, I'll talk about one of them that primarily relies, or one, one set of them that primarily relies on biological sex to determine eligibility um, for women's sports. And I focus on eligibility for women's sports here in the paper as well. So many states have recently passed these laws. You all have probably heard of them um, called transgender, and they're typically referred to as transgender sports bans or things like the Save Women's Sports Act, et cetera. Um, so these laws typically define sex to include some combination of genitals at birth, chromosomes, um, and testosterone levels, but not circulating testosterone levels uh, that, are, that can be affected by medication, but rather the ones that are naturally produced by the body. Um, so for instance, the law in Iowa um, requires um, students, well, if, they're, if a student's sex is challenged, they, the law requires that the student verify their sex using either the student's reproductive anatomy, their genetic makeup, or these naturally produced testosterone levels. So essentially, this law completely bars transgender women and girls from playing, playing sports. Um, and they typically apply to all age levels, including uh, to age levels um, that of, of students who have not yet gotten through puberty even. So <clears throat> fairly obviously, these laws methods for determining who is female um, have nothing to do with the purpose, the stated purposes of these laws. The stated purposes of these laws are typically competitive fairness in sports and uh, safety. But none of these methods affect athletic performance or safety. Um, so, you know, someone's whether someone has a vagina, ovaries, uterus, that's not going to affect athletic performance. Chromosomes may be correlated with things that can affect athletic abilities, but in and of themselves, they're not related to athletic skills. And third, as for the testosterone level, um, circulating testosterone, not this other type of testosterone that they look at, is what's driving, what may be driving any re relevant um, physical differences when it comes to athletic performance. So none of those three methods for determining sex have anything to do with 
the stated purposes. And this misalignment between stated purposes and methods, this gross misalignment, uh, can, can help expose you know, the actual purposes of the law, which are to exclude transgender women from sports. Um, so what would a context-informed approach for sex-segregated sports look like? This question is a bit more complicated than with, um, than with race or sexual orientation, but um, the first question would be sort of what exactly is it about sex that relates to competitive advantage or safety? So it would require disaggregating the broader category of sex and determining the relevant aspects, uh, traits for which this use of sex is being used as a proxy. So as, as we talked about, the context informs would not consider genitals, chromosomes, um, or naturally circulating testosterone, or, or excuse me, natural testosterone. There's some evidence that um, circulating testosterone could be related to things like muscle mass. Um, so it could take, this approach could take testosterone levels into account, um, but you know this that conclusion would hinge on the empirical connection between um, testosterone and things that are related to competitive advantage and safety. Um, I have a lot more to say about about that, but quickly I'll just summarize. I'll just skip to the um, benefits I think of this approach. So first, a context informed approach produces. Um, more accurate results and advances the purposes of the law, whereas a context detached approach doesn't. Um, relatedly, a context uh, informed approach promotes transparency and can help unearth nefarious purposes um, behind a law, kind of like we talked about with the with the sex example. Um, so, and that's and that's because misalignment between a law's stated goals and its methods uh, can indicate that its stated goals are not its actual goals. So examining the methods can reveal the actual functions. Um, it also reduces privacy intrusions, which I can talk about more right now. I'm out of time. And it also avoids naturalized and essentialized notions um, of identity and happy to go into any of that uh, more in the Q&A. Thank you again so much for accommodating me virtually and looking forward to our discussion. Thank you, Laura. And we have about eight minutes left. I have notes and most of my questions I've had, um, you guys answered them during the presentation. So thank you so much. But I'll open the floor to questions. So does anyone have any questions for the panelists? Margaret? <laughs> um, yeah, this is a question for Laura Lane-Steele, who's no longer on. Let's keep Laura up there, if possible. There she is. Hey, Laura. Hey, good so, to see you. Nice to see you. So thank you so much for your paper, and thanks to all the panelists. These were very thought-provoking and interesting papers. Um, but for you, I'm wondering if you would be happy just as home gets defined in tax law statutes or might get defined in uh, family law or uh, civil procedure statutes, would you be interested in having identity be codified in these different doctrinal areas? Yeah, that's... Um a good question. I, I think um, I want to perhaps, I, I need to think more about that, but my initial response is that I would stay away perhaps from codification where possible, um, recognizing that sometimes that might be necessary. Um, more so, I think, uh, like a lot of times we're not trying to figure out actual identity. We're just trying to apply the law, like with asylum or with um, the Title VII case I talked about. And that doesn't really require codifying any particular definition of, of race or sex, unless, you know, to the extent we want to define it as perceived race or perceived sex. Uh, but, you know, at least for those couple of examples, I can I don't think anything more specific than that would be helpful. But again, I, I think I need to think more on, on that question. Thank you. Anyone else? 
ask a question. Sure. So um, thank you, Ariel, so much for your great talk. I found it so thought provoking. Um, I, I'm curious. So I love the idea of focusing on the privilege instead of the oppression. I think that's just a really fascinating concept, but I wondered if you could go and talk a little bit more about like what that move does, like where, like, how does that help us? Cause I, completely by your argument at the beginning that were the anti-discrimination uh, laws have kind of were really reaching the limit of what they're doing for us. So I'm wondering like how, when you flip the default, like how do, how can we use that to advance, um, you know, gender equality? I think I, I like, I, I provided some of the answers in the presentation, maybe not all of them, but I, I feel like what it mainly does is just, I'm trying to get rid of I mean, I'm responding to a very specific context, which is in Europe, like, you know, within the gender or like within the feminist movement, you have what's now called like the gender critical movement or the more better known as trans exclusionary radical mm -hmm. feminist movement who are really gaining power and sort of like trying to exclude and come up with just definitions of women and stuff and excluding trans people from um, the movement and actually trying to further oppress trans people. Mm -hmm. And I think, it's sad because what it does, it creates all these debates within feminism about what does it mean to be a woman? And we're focusing and we're putting all our energy onto those fights in between us. Whereas, um, and, and also, for example, if you look at, I have that as well, I think it's useful, but within the LGBT community or the LGBTQ community rather, like, you know, this sort of, um, the divide between the, the say, the, the, yeah, how do you call them? Um, gay people and lesbian people that sort of like you know just are trying to live a very okay life and then the queer people who are like no actually we just need to defy all the norms and, and shake it all up and you start seeing like really a sort of divide between them and i understand that and i think that divide is very useful to 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 have but at the same time i think that it takes us away from who's the real oppressor here. yeah and i think that by just flipping the focus we're like again looking at instead of like fighting between each other oh let's look up and then like let's do something because in the end we're all we're all being oppressed by by that system and so it's just trying to refocus on 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 the system basically so i guess one follow-up so is it more a rhetor like a, a rhetorical shift or is this like are you envisioning like a legal claim that could be brought under this theory no okay, it's, okay. yeah i think it's more sort of a way of thinking okay. about it and seeing the line and like doing all that yeah we have another question. To all three of you, that was really thought provoking, great way to kick off. So my question was for Ariel, who I want to commend. That was an excellent presentation and I love hearing from my fellow Belgian here um, in Baltimore. So my question was, I know you're kind of defining your, your research, your, your PhD, and I was wondering when you're talking about masculinity um, as property, if you mean masculinity, like the, the male, typically male traits, or you mean maleness, like just being a man. And in that case, I would then ask, what about uh, femaleness, right? Um, and then whether this isn't more kind of cisgenderness as property then, because certainly being a woman in certain contexts can can also be you know empowering right and gives us certain rights or or identity. So can't we just apply the same idea to women, um, and then can we make it just broader and saying having like a clear gender identity is really what gives us these these you know privileges in a way? Yeah. So that's my question. Thank you. That has also been my question literally um, five months ago. <laughs> so yeah, I have been thinking about that as well. And um, again, saying I wanted to intervene in this sort of turf discourse versus like well and 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 that. And so I started to think, well, if you think about that, what it is, it's a subset of uh, feminists that are trying to um, maintain the relative few privileges that they have of being a cis woman and and seeing the oppressor in trans woman. And so then that, that debate really does lead you to start thinking about cisgender femininity as property as well. And so I had that question myself, should I just start seeing, maybe you talking about feminine, like seeing all different kinds of identities as property. And um, I think I, I, I started that way off, but then I came back to the original idea of masculinity as property, because I think that 
cisgender femininity. Definitely certain gender identities have our property and have certain um, property power, okay? But they have different kinds of property power and I think the value that they have are different. And I think that in a way, maybe, yes, indeed, cisgender femininity is starting to acquire certain forms of power, um, property power, value, if you want to. But in the end, ultimately, cisgender femininity has still lesser value than um, masculinity. And I think that by just focusing on masculinity, again, it's sort of doing intersectionality upside down, just like rather than looking completely at below, you look completely at up, and then, you know, we'll see how it trickles down. So I'm still grappling with that question. I think eventually I will start doing that as well. And I might write a paper about it, but I first wanted to talk about masculinity and then see how we move on. Um, and also, again, just, I think there is value in doing that, but at the same time, then again, I, I was thinking that about that as well, but then you start into this whole debate about cisgender versus transgender, very useful, but given what I want to do is focus on the top rather than focusing on the divides, like to, to unite us again. And so I, I, that's why I focused first on masculinity as property, and then we'll see if, if it's useful to start talking about cisgender femininity as property or not. I hope that was, it's my thinking process, it's, yeah. I'm not, I'm not there yet. One more question? Okay, I think we're done, okay. Yeah, so we are concluding the first part of the conference. Thank you so much. We have a 15 minute break and we'll come back at 10.30.